Today's market call is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. One PM on the East Coast. That's Dan Nathan. I'm Guy Adami. Hope you folks are well. Before we get into the market, and there is a lot to talk about. There was a travesty last night oh. at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. It was it, wait, wait was there a murder? Was there like a murder, or was I'll tell there, you like, what, was there a dead body somewhere in the? In you know, the, in before the... See, after Fast Money last night, Tim Seymour and I, were both giant fans, by the yeah. way, were sitting in our green room, which is actually a coat closet. Uh, and I said to Tim, I said, I got a really funny feeling about this game. I think this is one of those nights where the Giants could put up 36 and just throttle Seattle. I'm thinking 36 to 10. I just got a good feeling, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll tell you, the first drive, they're moving the ball down the field. Um, and then, you know, like yeah. like in the Dallas game, when instead of getting a block field goal for a touchdown, they, they go for it on fourth down, where every other team in the NFL, for whatever reason, is able – to make that play work, the Giants uh, were not able to. And then it was downhill from there. I, I don't even know what to say as yeah. a Giant fan. No, I, I you know, Kai, I felt for you. Um, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Sorry, I sorry. did a little bit. I mean, I, you know, in our 250 pool, I took your Giants, okay? Yeah. And I know because I was listening to all these off-season maneuvers and Saquon and all this sort of stuff, and uh, it's a disaster. So I feel bad for you. I do feel bad for you. Um, there is a lot going on. We're going to be out in, in, in 30. We're going to do a hot 30 um, today, guy. Um, let's talk about what's going on here. Because yesterday on the set of Fast Money, okay, you and I were both on. And, you know, a couple of our friends were like, oh, I thought the market traded pretty well, you know, considering the." And I was like, no, I thought the market traded horribly. And I get it, dude. Like the NASDAQ was up 80 bips or something like that. And the S&P, which was down you know, 60 or 70 bips rallied back to close unchanged on the day. But I was like, if you look at what's going on in the market, not the things that are dragging the NASDAQ up or getting the S&P back to unchanged, but we were talking about transports. We're talking about industrials. We're talking about banks that act God awful. If you look at like, you know, I get it with a uh, utilities guy with what was going on with interest rates. You know what I mean? But down five and a half percent. I mean, that seemed kind of insane. And you're telling me the market traded well thoughts on that because you didn't make any, you, you, you didn't, you didn't comment on that. Uh, did you think the market traded well yesterday? And now we're looking at an S and P down one and a quarter and a NASDAQ down one and a half percent today. You're on mute, bud. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, everyone. I was going to say through the lens of the S and P, I thought the market traded okay. I was surprised that the S and P wasn't down thirty handles. But you made the salient point, which is that the S and P is what is what it is. Below the surface, there was a lot of damage done, and that's really where you needed to look. And you know, you go no further than the banks, which you know, Bank of America, fifty-two week low, multi-year low, Wells Fargo, City, not trading particularly well. You have to ask yourself, you know, what are those stocks telling you? What is Target telling you at a multi-year low? I mean, obviously a lot of it's Target specific, but yep. that's telling a story. Utilities, to your point, should not move that way. That's a problem. Like you has to wonder what's going on there. And then obviously this move in interest rates, I don't think people fully comprehend what it truly means. We have been discussing it for months and I'll just put a ribbon on it and saying, and we have talked about this, dollar yen got to that 150 level and you know the bank of japan can do all they want the reality is they have a weakening currency they're the largest owner of treasuries in the world and they're going to have to do things to support their currency at some point and it probably means they have been and will continue to be sell of treasury so i don't know how any of this is particularly bullish I, you know but i've said this is all things that i've been saying for a while now it's starting to manifest itself in some of the price action. Listen, dude, and there's a there's a phrase, you know, there's certain phrases, market idioms that, that, that get you exercised here. The one that I literally can't stand. I, trade, I wanna... trade the market that you have. That's the one. That's what makes you crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it makes me batshit crazy. And, and I'll tell you why. Because I go back, I, I can't remember like, like how many times like folks said this on the set of Fast Money to us in late 2021, they were saying the same thing. Okay, which market? Because what I'm looking at, 
Okay. If I'm looking at all, all the inputs, if I'm looking at the dollar, I'm looking at yields, I'm looking at commodities. Okay. And I want to then go look at the stock market because that's what I trade, right? Or I trade options on stocks, you know, or ETFs, that sort of thing. All those inputs are telling me the market we have, it's a big fugazi. Okay. Like, like, because if I look under the hood of the S&P 500 and we go back to all those sectors that are in correction mode down 10%, at least from their recent highs, except semiconductors and except some software companies that are supposed to like, you know, revolutionize the world with large language models and generative AI models. You know what I mean? The market that we have sucks. Okay. Like it sucks, especially after last year where the S&P closed down 20% and the NASDAQ closed down 30%. So you have the entire major indices. Okay. That are in the hands, of maybe 15 mm -hmm. stocks. When you have the equal weight S and P down on the year, you have uh, you know Russell two thousand small caps down on the year, and then don't even get me into transports. Don't even banks. Are you freaking kidding me? They act like dog shit. They're literally they're literally telling us that we are about to go into a recession, or we are going to be unchanged on the year in the stock market between now and year end. That's what it's all telling me. Banks are a problem without question. Again, they're, they are telling a story that people are choosing not to listen to. And I think a lot of these banks have gotten themselves way off sides in terms of this move in interest rates without question. Listen, I am not a bank CEO. I'm not a bank CFO. But if you're worth your salt, you should have seen this coming. Why do I say that? Well, quite frankly, because a lot of people have seen it coming and we've been talking about it for quite some time. So that's sort of, I guess, a backhanded compliment to ourselves. But with that said, you know, banks are the, if you think about an economy that's 73% driven by people buying things, a lot of times people buying things using credit, banks are the lenders of those funds. And if bank lending sort of starts to tighten or God forbid, seize up, think about the ramifications for our economy. So it's a problem, Dan. And I think you're right to point it out. I think the you know, I understand why people say that trade the market that you have instead of the, I mean, I understand it in theory. I understand why it's um, maddening as well. You know, I think the, the proper saying is, you know, embrace the environment that you find yourselves in and then trade it from there. I mean, that's nuanced, but I think that's sort of what makes a lot of sense. Well, it's just lazy. I mean, like the truth is you and I have been on Wall Street, you know, for, you know, me, I'm getting 27 years, you know, you a little, a little more than 30. I mean, I don't know too many people who just sit there and just trade the NASDAQ and the S&P all day long. You know what I mean? Like those are the people who actually are in the pits of the CME, you know, for all those years that like, and it's a very small group of folks who do that. Now, a lot of people trade S&P, NASDAQ, Stack and major indices, okay, as hedges. But the Wall Street that I grew up on, we traded sectors. We looked at relative performance in individual stocks or like among sectors or asset classes or this, that, whatever. So the whole idea of like where somebody is just trying to be condescending if you're fighting a, a, a market move, you know what I mean, is trade the market that you have. Well, that's pretty stupid because then you grew up in a wall street that most people um that i know most pros you know don't kind of see it that way so for whatever that's worth um that's that all right guy let's talk about rates here um for a second this is fed's mester says one more rate hike may be needed this yeah. year the cme i know the cme fed funds tracker is i think it was like close to 10 percent for a 25 basis point hike at the mm -hmm. november meeting and now it's 30% if we just want to throw that chart up there. So that's been moving higher. Inflationary readings have not really abated at all, right? Nor will and they, I, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yes, we can, and continue because you're right. I mean, it's amazing how quickly this is snapped back. And that's obviously today's problem, but continue. Yeah, no. And then our friend Peter Bookbar, he was talking about uh, the jolts. And I think this is kind of interesting. Bottom line, the algos went nuts in response mm -hmm. with a rise of 4.75 in the 10 year, a dollar rise, the equity sell off. But this is not the best data point on the jobs picture. Multiple lists things can be posted for one job in different states and different role titles and salaries can also be listed for one job as employers experiment with what applications they get back. The slowdown in hiring, um, I believe, is a clear trend. So what Peter's saying here is that the economy is weakening, all right, mm -hmm. based on some of the data um, that they're seeing. And I guess your point is also it's a tough job for the Fed, right? Because like right now, you know, they, they do have a lots of different data, you know, that are coming in that are 
suggesting that maybe the economy is still fairly resilient. The consumer is still fairly resilient, but some of the stuff under the hood last and on fast money, we talked about leading economic indicators from the conference board. They're down 18 months in a row here. So the economy is weakening and they continue with a hawkish stance into a weakening economy, which has a, the ability to really cause unemployment to go up pretty quickly if the man falls off guy. Well, that's what, that's exactly what's going to happen. And I've, I've, I've thought this for a while as well. You know, I guess the unemployment rate in the country is what three, seven ish, whatever, whatever it is. I think mm -hmm. people are going to be alarmed by how quickly we go from these levels, which we've been at for quite some time to North of four and a half percent. And it could take place over the course of a couple months. Cause that's how fast these things move. Now, the fallacy that the Fed, I think, believes is that they somehow can control the unemployment rate once it starts to go in the trajectory upward that they want it to go in. I want to be very clear. They want higher unemployment. Of course, they're not going to be able to stop it because once it starts to build on itself, it sort of cascades the same way uh, the inflation data cascaded on them. So you said they don't have an easy task. You're right. But as you know, I mean, my sympathy for the Federal Reserve is zero or less than zero because they're trying to fix the problems that they've created. And a lot of people say the Fed is making a mistake now, which might be true. Of course, the mistakes were made years before and they find themselves in a very awkward, difficult position, which I don't think they can extricate themselves from. And I think the market is starting to pick up on that. You know, if you want to continue to fight inflation, which is a problem. Rates have to remain high or go higher. The market won't like that. You know, if in fact you want to sort of slow down the, the, a, a market move or an economy that's going to sort of cascade lower, they're going to have to stop and start to lower rates. And of course, that will just sort of reignite inflation. And that's it. I mean, that's it in a nutshell. So, you, you know, you choose your poison and yeah. then live with your live with your decisions based on that. Yeah, well, it seems like they're um, in that position where, you know, like the, the next move if the economy does weaken dramatically is going to be like, it'll be interesting to see, you know, when they were get kind of, you know, doing those 75 basis point hikes, right. They had what four consecutive, like, how will they start to cut? You know what I mean? Like, will they start to cut 25 basis points and just kind of, you know, I, I think that David Rosenberg of Rosenberg research makes this point all the time. Doug Cass makes this point also um, over at Seabreeze is that, you know, you really actually don't want to be buying stocks when the fed starts to cut because like they're, they're going to well, be behind the curve a little bit. And, right. and therefore, yeah. What, what will, what will be the mechanism? What will be the trigger that force them to Correct. cut? Then that's, you know, that's the issue. That's why, you know, in a, in a book, it might make sense. Of course, academic, you know, in academia, things make sense. In real life, usually the opposite happens. We have a question real quick yeah. from Piccolo Mondo on the cheap. I like that name. What are your thoughts on Bristol, Myers, Pfizer, and Merck? Um, so I don't know if we can pull up a Merck chart. Full disclosure, my wife has worked at Merck for quite some time. Stock, I think, topped out around 119. I think it's down to 103 now. It has not traded particularly well over the last couple months, but I think you're going to find yourselves pretty quickly at levels of support. So obviously the moving average is flattened out here in Merck. Makes sense. I guess you could say we're starting to sort of trend a little bit lower in the moving averages, but I do think we're going to start to find support in the levels that we're at now that we saw back in the spring and then earlier than that. So that's Merck in a nutshell. Pfizer is a completely different animal. I mean, there's no compelling reason, I don't think, to own Pfizer. It's been no man's land except for that one huge spike for quite some time. If you were to sort of extend this out and look over the last 10 years or so, you will see the Pfizer's basically been, as Carter would say, a pair of twos. You know, you had that big spike, but what else have you really had? Bristol Myers is interesting on valuation, BMY. But every time it starts to peak its head up, it sort of gets whacked down. So what's wound up happening is we've seen the winners in the form of Eli Lilly, which, by the way, is probably off close to $90 or so from its all-time high that we saw a month or so ago. That's going to be a level that's going to find support, I think, pretty quickly. Johnson & Johnson's its own animal. And then Merck sort of pulling up the number three spot. Novo Nordisk, again, its own animal vis-a-vis a lot of these weight loss drugs, but, you know, Pfizer to me, no touch Bristol, very frustrating. 
But Merck, I think, is a pretty big support level stand. Yeah, I just mentioned um, Eli Lilly and Novo, which you just mentioned, which obviously, have, you know, they got to a half a trillion dollars in market cap each, I think, maybe Lilly a bit more than Novo. And, you know, there are huge gaps to be filled there. It looks like Novo is trying to do that right now. So mind the gap on those. Um, you just mentioned Carter Braxton Worth of Worth Charting. I think he's going to be with us tomorrow. Guy, he had talking about gaps, he had a report out on worth charting today. He's talking about the S&P. The unfilled gap from June 2nd just now has been filled exactly four months later. Friday, June 2nd, the S&P uh, gapped up on the open. That got it above that kind of 4,200 level in the cash guy. And so I think it's as interesting. I, I love how Carter does this because he obviously um, is a technical analyst, but I, I think sentiment is a big draw about uh, what he does. This is back on June 2nd. This is the headline. The stock surged as a strong May jobs report uh, and the news that Thursday that the Senate passed the debt ceiling bill eased fears over a U.S. debt default and a market uh, slowdown in the economy. But today, the news, Wall Street is sinking Tuesday as it uh, focuses on the downside of a surprisingly mm -hmm. strong job report. So talk to us about bookending well, that guy. You talk about the laziness associated with saying trade the market you have. The same laziness occurs with these headline writers for these different whatever agencies yeah. or news. And it's the same thing. You know, they're just looking for they're just looking for reasons to explain what happened. So to Carter's point, what was good yeah. three, four months ago in terms of these headline writers is now a bad thing. But you know, it was good only through the lens of the market, which went higher. And now it's bad only through the lens of the same market, which is going lower. But to use your word that you used earlier, it's just lazy. But Carter is correct to point that out. He is crazy. Uh, or he, he, he is correct. He's not crazy. I, I just conflated crazy and lazy. Um, all right. Let's look at the S&P 500 futures here, Guy. If you look at that 200-day moving average, which basically is, is fairly much in mm -hmm. line with that uptrend that's been in place from the October low, you see the 4224-ish level. Um, you also see that 4200-ish level, which was that breakout from June 2nd, right? So if we look at the lines here, maybe X marks the spot. Maybe that's a level where you get um, a little bit of support. I mean, it should be a big support level if you think of all those lines coming together a little bit. What do you think here? Do we get there and do we pause and do we grind a little bit? Because you remember that April, May period below 4,200, that was a grind. We were in the camp that it was going to break one way or the other. It obviously broke to the upside. I think a lot of the excitement in and around AI and that guidance that NVIDIA gave with that huge 20 some percent gap after mm -hmm. its earnings, um, you know, got the broad market going here. Are we likely to see an overshoot though? Or, and, and do you think it's a good press on the short side um, here? Or do you want to kind of let it breathe a little bit in and around 42 and a quarter? All right. A lot of questions there. Let's try to address them. I mean, this is obviously a pretty strong, well defined uptrend in terms of the trend line and in terms of the moving average, which, by the way, is still sloping higher. So this is a logical place to start uh, adding to or take, adding to a long position or taking off a short position. I want to be clear. I also want to be clear that I still think the market goes lower from here. So should we stop here and bounce? Yes. Uh, will that happen? Well, if you look at what's happened over the last hour or so, you know, you saw a bounce from, I think, 42.23 or so in the S&P to about 42.41 or so a few minutes ago. So, you know, I know it's not a big deal. I'm not trying to say that's – but you can see 20, 30-point yeah. bounces. You saw that yesterday. And that's this battle line that's being drawn at these levels. To answer your question, is it a good press here? No. But this is what I will say, though, to sort of amplify that. I think it could be a great press if we, too, close below – that moving average. So you would effectively be through the trend line, through the moving average. And then I think is when you start to play offense on the downside. So is it a good press here? No. It could potentially be a great press, 25, 30 handles lower, which is somewhat counterintuitive, yeah. but that's really how you trade. I, I like that. Um, I would just say it'd be nice to see if we got down towards that 200 day and then we bounce. Let's say we rallied a, a percent or two, you know, that sort of thing. I guess my point and, and, th and then look to reshort them, guys. My point is like, what are you buying here? Right. So, so like next Friday, we're going to get some of the money center banks that are reporting it. And again, 
We're going to spend a lot of time next week talking about the banks. Are they a great press right here uh, acting so poorly into the results? You know what I mean? Like probably not like, uh, you know what I mean? Like I, I wouldn't be selling the banks right here playing for some Armageddon scenario because I think a lot of the relative underperformance over the last couple months is probably encapsulated that any decent news the stocks pop they're not popping much because they're not going to have anything to say about some turn in the economy some inflection point some miraculous ability to deal with their mark to market held to maturity sort of you know losses especially when their deposits are are becoming uh, you know harder and harder to keep you know paying higher and higher interest rates so to me but but the, the sentiment thing is a really good one so we'll spend some time on the banks but i agree if the s p were to kind of bounce off that 200 day get a couple uh percentage points to the upside then maybe you look to do it but you want to be careful with the things that are really oversold and trying to press them um all right so this guy really quickly before we get to rates because we, we um had a great discussion on fast money last night and i think it actually is something that a lot of people are talking about a lot of people have been hitting me about rick santelli cnbc's you know um analyst was on um, and he was doing some charts by hand with us and he had a, a big proclamation. We're going to run that in a second. But real quickly, before we leave equity land, this NASDAQ E-mini 100 futures chart, right? it mm -hmm. is sitting right on that uptrend. It is holding it. Now you look at where that 200 day moving average is, it's much lower than where the S&P is. And a lot of that is because the outperformance this year and a Tesla and an NVIDIA and that sort of thing. Talk to me about this one, because is this maybe a better press than the S&P 500? That's the one that's precarious, right? And that's the one that if we were to close below this trend line, then you do a hard press and look for a move back down to the moving average. And, yeah. you know, again, sometimes sometimes you buy on strength and you continue to play the momentum. Well, it's the same way you can press on the downside if, in fact, we start to breach and violate these trend lines. But as as interesting as the S&P minis look, this looks more interesting. So you have to be... I think if you're watching this and again as closely as we do, if you get a close below that trend line and you know you get a couple days of sort of protracted weakness, I think it's almost a foregone conclusion that we test that moving average. By the way, that we haven't seen since March, which co coincidentally was the same time as Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, these all these things sort of line up. So I think we're going there. I want to be crystal clear, yeah. but I understand why you'd want to wait for a violation of the trend line. Yeah, well, I get it. And the other thing I'll just say about tech as we get into earnings, and it's probably not until the third week uh, in the bulk of them, the fourth week of October is like, depending upon where the NASDAQ 100 is, you know, it might not be a great trade. Like if we do break that trend line and the sentiment is really bad, you know, if some of these companies that started selling off after they gave Q2 results and Q3 guidance, right, they're down 15, 20%, and then they come in line and the guidance is not particularly bad, it's in line, the stocks probably pop, but is it the sort of thing that you buy up like on that i don't think so so you know listen we got a lot of time between um now and then all right let's talk about this because i think rick santelli came on set usually he's in chicago he's not on our show um all too often but guy he drew some charts he was talking about the 10-year yield let's run the tape and let's talk about it because my eyebrows certainly went up and i know there's plenty of folks who have hit me today and probably you about what he had to say because there's not a whole heck of a lot of folks out there suggesting that we might see double digits in the 10-year yield. Let's run the tape. I personally always find anniversary dates very key. And I can't help thinking about September of 81 when we had the all-time high closing yield just shy of 16%. So what I'm talking about here might be dancing between the raindrops. You never want to go against a market that is burning to the upside. But you might want to give it a pause if it looks like it's going to back away a bit. But in the grand scheme of things, I think rates are going higher. So let's go to the charts. Like I said, not my best work, but high, low, perpendicular midpoint. We always pay attention to those, especially when one of those points is the all-time low closing yield at a half of 1%. So you take the high, you take the low, you connect it, you find that midpoint, you draw a perpendicular line. And what you find is it just keeps you on the straight and narrow. Those are very key. The more important the spike levels are, whether it's a key high or key bottom, those make it work that much better. Now, this chart is really off scale. Remember, when you're doing these charts, you got to use logarithmic paper. This is just a rough gauge, but there's your near 16%, SEP and 81 for your anniversary date. And the whole point of this chart is, is that we have a lot of potential room to run to the upside. So if somebody asked me and held a gun to my head and said, listen, the worst case scenario, we're 
Treasury rate's going to go 10 year. I'd say in the next seven years, you should be able to see 13 and a half, 14 percent. Yeah. Whoa. Next 10 years, even seven to 10 years, you see double digits. It's not inconceivable to think we would see that. Now, again, in the context of, of that, think about what we've seen over the last 15 or so years of effectively zero interest rates within reason. So, you know, the pendulum swings one way. Well, it swings the other way as well. And there's a very good chance that we might have to pay for the excesses of the last couple of decades in the form of higher yields going forward. So that is not out of the question. I don't know what that means for the equity market. You know, I, I again, I'm hard pressed to figure out how we get there. But again, I don't think it's completely ridiculous. With that said, I mean, Rick is a legend in terms of uh, the fixed income and bond markets, and he's forgotten more than I'll know. And he did those charts by hand, and he does meticulous work. He does his work is the same way that Carter does, you know, the work that, that he does in terms of charts. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I know he's no fan of central banks. You know, we've had these conversations off air. We've had the conversations on air. But I guess the question you have to ask yourself is how does this whole thing play itself out and how is it all reconciled in terms of yields? As we're sitting here, I think 10-year yields today got somewhere around 4.79%. And as we're sitting here right now, I think we're about 478 Not good, Dan. Yeah, no, and and this has been your call. Uh, kudos to you. Let's pull up a one year. This is or actually a two year. This is not a log chart, but you see that kind of well defined uptrend. You see the consolidation. You see the breakout here. I think it was interesting. I, I think the first <laughs> point he made, though, guy, in the near term, is that you might see a pullback, mm -hmm. a consolidation, and you know maybe something that looks like four and a quarter or so. That uptrend is basically four percent. If we were to go from four eight to four percent, though, that's a that's a massive Huge. move. Okay, so so like we're let's let's keep this one on our radar i think on a long-term basis here's a log chart okay this is the 20 year and you see that upside potential you know maybe it keeps ripping and it gets you know towards that kind of four nine five percent or something like that jamie diamond said that he could see seven percent and then this is a 40-year chart you just see that it's broken that like long-term uptrend going back to that anniversary date that rick is talking about the only thing i'll say here is that okay if we have double digits in the 10 year, we got some funky stuff going on in the US economy. And I just don't imagine that that is gonna be too kind to uh, stocks, at least the valuations that we have right now, which are basically in line or above the 10 year average on a valuation basis, where to your point that you just made guy, where interest rates were much lower. So that, that to me is one of the most important points there. Pick up a textbook, it'll tell you that rising interest rates usually are associated with an economy that's stronger. And yeah, that there is a truth to that. Flip side of the coin is sometimes it's for the wrong reasons. And I think we find ourselves in this world where rates are going up for the wrong reasons. All the reasons that we've talked about on this show on Fast Money, quickly again, though, the market is demanding a higher yield to buy our debt, on top of which the holders of our debt are seemingly unloading it. And this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. This is going on around the world. We have talked about the weakness in dollar yen for a while. As a matter of fact, we did a podcast a month or so ago that we entitled Turning Japanese, and that's playing out right before our very eyes. And again, kudos to Danny Moses. You know, They are seemingly, the experiment that they started four decades or so ago is unraveling right before our eyes. And again, I don't think the market pays enough attention to that. So None of these things are particularly good. I would love to find the silver lining here. The silver lining, by the way, is finally there's some normalization that's going to take place. Of course, the problem is getting to that point of normalization. Yeah, let's pull up the dollar yen uh, for a second here because the headline this morning is was it uh, you know top 150 briefly a level it hadn't seen and. Uh, over a year, but it quickly pulled back. There was a bit of volatility, um, and I thought that was pretty interesting. But but again, keep your eye on that. The U.S. dollar index, the Dixie above 107. I think we have a chart um, right there, and and that one, you know, look at that. I mean, you know, that that's that's a level, right, guy? That it's gotten through there. So keep an eye on that. Which brings us to gold. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know. You and Danny have been all over gold. I mean, like, you know, you, you guys are in the camp and we just mentioned Peter Bookvar. He is in that camp. He's been on our pods before that that uh, portfolio should have low single digits uh, always, that sort of thing. And you, you've you been detailing central bank buying of gold, that sort of thing, but it doesn't act well. And it doesn't act well, even with that 
dollar moving the way it has. So we look at this chart here. Um, it got very near those February lows, guys. You see that well-defined downtrend um, that it's been in from the highs in the summer um, a little bit. You know, let, let's think about, you know, if you're bullish here, okay, and we thought maybe it would hold that 200-day moving average um, a few weeks ago, it, it fell, you know, like a lug right mm -hmm. through it. And now it's back towards those levels. Using futures, you think this is probably not a bad level to take a shot on the long side and play for a move back towards that 200-day moving average and that declining, um, you know, trend line that we've seen from yeah. these guys. So we've taken a lot of heat, and by the way, deservedly so about this gold call. I mean, it's in retrospect, again, in retrospect, the strength of the dollar, higher bond yields historically have been headwinds for the gold market, which I totally understand. I still think it's going to rectify itself and, and sort out where there's this flight to quality as things start to further unravel in the form of gold. But obviously, it hasn't played out that way. If you look at it, though, Central banks bought a record amount of gold last year. I think $70 billion of gold, I think 1,221 tons. And, you know, the first seven, eight months of this year, they're on a similar pace. So the buying is there. The buyers are there. Of course, the price action is not. What's going to happen here? Well, you're right to point out that we're at support levels. And can we sort of outline a trade that we think you can put on vis-a-vis -vis futures? But this is critical support. I do think there's going to be a point where people realize really what's going on in terms of rates, in terms of currencies, and they're finding their way back into gold. Obviously, it hasn't happened over the last couple months, though. Yeah. All right. So let's do two things right here. Okay. And you make the point, you know, like you, you weren't trading gold when you say that, you know, like I think folks should be exposed to gold and have a few percent of their portfolio in that it's really this kind of inflation hedge or this, you know, this kind of, um, you know, you, you would call it the, the bet the central bank ineptitude and the like there, right? Like a hedge against that a little bit. Um, but what we're talking about here is a trade using futures, using stops and really, you know, better defining a risk. So, you know, Gold's trading about 1830, 1831 here, guy. Um, you know, what I would say is if you want to use futures and you want to get long here, you want a fairly tight stop. I mean, maybe 1810 is a good level. That was very near that February low. I don't think breaking that, you want to be long that. And you want to look to a target at about 1927 or so. That is that downtrend that's been in place, you know, over the last kind of six months or so. And that's also where that declining 200 day moving average kind of, kind of bundles up there a little bit. So the idea would be that risking about 20 here to possibly make you know, 80, 90 or something like that, if you get that move. And then you would keep raising your stop, right? Mm -hmm. If this thing starts to bounce here. So I just want to make the differentiation between using futures to kind of set up a really good risk reward trade off an oversold condition, especially if you think the dollar is about to pull back a little bit, if yields were about to pull back a little bit. This trade makes some sense to me, especially if you're bullish of gold longer term, but you also think it's oversold near term guy. Well, it's it's going to be interesting to see to your point about yields. You know, I've I've pointed out, I think the only logical explanation for yields to go lower at this point is a flight to quality on the back of something happening. And that back of something happening might be an equity market sell off. So if yields were to stop here and get down to the levels of Rick Santelli mentioned yesterday in terms of just a pause, you know, that's obviously going to be bearish for the dollar, which then should be a catalyst for gold to go higher. So it all makes a lot of sense, but the reality is it's about risk reward. And I think to risk 20, 30 to make maybe, you know, it's like a three, four to one. I think you'll do that every day. So that's how I look at it. The frustration in my voice is exactly that frustration because, you know, you think you have this peg, you know, you can see what's going on. Yet it's not making, it's not, again, it's not manifesting itself in the price action. Yeah. No, well, I, you know, again, I think it's important to differentiate the difference between like, you know, or, or highlight the difference between a trade and, and really what should be in an investment portfolio for diversification. All right. Last thing before we get out of here, let's look at crude oil here, guy, because um, it looked like it wanted to break out. It looked like it wanted to get through those, those highs that we saw 94 ish or so last fall. Um, quick drop. Um, over the last few trading days, um, mm -hmm. do you 
Is, is that reflective of maybe, you know, like some investors like thinking about weaker economy sort of stuff here? Because, you know, you could have drawn an uptrend um, from those lows from just, you know, the summer or so. And, you know, like you could probably see a pullback towards the mid 80s. And that would kind of be support with that up trend you see that 200 day moving average which is kind of turning up a little bit 77 and a half or so do you think there's risk to a big pullback um in crude on friday we detailed a trade in the xle using options on market call and by the way we're going to have another market call on friday carter is going to join guy and me and we're going to detail a couple options trades and we're going to actually go back and look at some of the ones that we talked about um on last friday's show and just to be clear as we did with the gold i mean Listen, you know, we'll take, uh, you know, little victory collapse here and there when things are right. We won't do them in celebration. We'll do them as like booking profits and, and kind of detail how we trade um, these different instruments, right? Like that sort of thing. And I think that's how we all learn and we learn from our mistakes because Guy and I have been doing this for a while and we still make plenty of mistakes and we're wrong a lot. We just have to make sure we don't let long, you know, like wrong trades turn into disasters. I think that's a big part of this whole thing. So what do you think here in, in Crude Guy? Because it could couldn't get through those year ago levels or so. Are we likely to see a consolidation, maybe make a little flag and gain some steam for a breakout? Or could you see a pullback to maybe that uptrend that would probably put it in the mid 80s or so? Yeah, I mean, 85 makes sense. That's probably where we topped out at in late July, early or mid August or something, late July, early August. So maybe a pullback there. I want to be clear with this as well. You know, I still think the commodity goes higher and I'm still thinking the underlying equities go significantly higher than we are now. I do think crude's in a very good spot right now for a myriad of different reasons. But the the biggest reason is continues to be this supply demand imbalance, which is there despite the fact that Europe is slowing, China is slowing, all these things that we know. So, you know, you see any uptick in China at all, I think it's gonna be a catalyst. So yes, I do think you can see a pullback. Yes, I continue to be bullish the underlying commodity. And I do think the equities will continue to go higher. We'll sort of reassert themselves in the coming weeks. All right. Well, that's it, guy. We covered a lot of ground good. here on a Tuesday. Here we got a uh, what do you say? Audi five thousand. We, we got, got a five thousand. Yeah. We got to thank our sponsor, CME Group. Dan, what what happens with CME Group? Uh, well, risk meets opportunity, guy. Love that, Laird Hamilton. Of course, yeah. those great ads. Obviously, want to thank the audience and all the people behind the scenes. We'll be back tomorrow. I think the great Carter Braxton Worth will be joining us. Yes, he will. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. See you tomorrow.